what I want to do now is um, cover, um, I, I want to move on and I want to cover several things. First, I want to talk about um, Rolling Thunder, then uh, the ground war, and then again from lost victory to Black April. I'll begin with Rolling Thunder. Well, everybody agrees that it failed, religious and orthodox uh, both. They don't agree on why. According to the orthodox analysis, North Vietnam was not suitable to strategic bombing inherited from World War II. It had an agricultural economy, uh, supplies came from outside, um, and so its ability to wage war um, could not be um, uh, limited and, and, and crippled and damaged as, as it was, of course, when we bombed industrialized countries like Germany and Japan. Interdiction was futile. Um, the guerrillas in the South, at least initially, um, didn't need the supplies from the North, although most Orthodox historians will admit that after, that this was only at the very beginning, by 1965, uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was important, and by 1970 or 71, it was uh, vital. Um, also, in terms of the bombing, we hear this all the time, the North Vietnamese were just too determined to, um, to discourage. What's the revisionist response? First of all, North Vietnam was vulnerable. And second, what I'll spend most of my time on, uh, the response um, is an effort to explain the real, real reasons that, um, that this failed. Um, Dale Walton, who wrote Vietnam, The Necessary War, um, does a real good job of turning the whole um, uh, orthodox statement uh, uh, position on its head. He points out that North Vietnam was very vulnerable um, to bombing. It had to, um, uh, it had to import all of its materials, all of its war materials, basically from either the Soviet Union or China. Had we, um, and we had the means to do this, closed down the port of Haiphong and other ports, we could have almost crippled the Soviet Union's ability to supply North Vietnam. Attacks on the railroads, on the highways, and the mining of internal waterway, waterways properly done um, could have seriously limited um, communist China's supply as well. And um, attacks done on infrastructure uh, beyond what we did, but on um, really the whole infrastructure of, of uh, um, North Vietnam, according to Walton, and I think he's right, could have crippled North Vietnam's ability to wage, wage war. Explaining the failure is more complicated. Um, let me begin with the message. Graduated pressure was designed to deliver a message that the North Vietnam can't win the war and it's not in their interest in use of capital calibration. Well, one of the things that did, especially with the pauses that took place, uh, is that it, it had the opposite effect. Um, it um, strengthened North Vietnam's determination um, they, uh, uh, you know, they, they, what they saw in it was, was American weakness. So that was the first thing. Um, gradu graduated pressure also allowed the North Vietnamese to prepare. They knew where we started. And again, if you look here, um, you can see on this how we gradually moved north. Uh, and, and the dates are there. And so, well, you didn't have to be a genius to know what was coming and when we were going to be coming. Um, so um, it allowed them to prepare, it allowed them to disperse their uh, resources, and allowed them to get ready for the next attack. And perhaps worst of all, graduated response, uh, gra you know, graduated, graduated pressure, let the North Vietnamese build a very effective and modern and up-to-date air defense system. What were called rules of engagement made all of this worse, and they compounded the problems. And they were of two types, um, operational and um, geographic and operational. And you can see it on the map, and I actually want to use this one. It's a little bit better. Um, but we can start, start, start here. First of all, geographically, at least initially, and you can see it from the, from the map here, um, right there. Um, Key areas um, were out of bounds. And initially, um, the 19th parallel, nothing north of that, then the 20th parallel. 
Um, even when these restrictions, restrictions were removed, certain areas were restricted and prohibited, and you see it clearly here by looking at the donuts. These maps are, look pretty much the same, um, but um, even, uh, even then, even when the restrictions um, uh, geographically were, were removed, you had these other restrictions as well. Um, operationally, um, targets that the military wanted to hit um, were not permitted uh, by, by Washington, um, usually because they were designated civilians, at least by Washington. Um, um, other military targets near civilian areas, um, there was restricted, uh, it was, they were restricted to or they couldn't be hit at all. Um, the, <clears throat> the rules of engagement were often changed, they were complicated, and sometimes it was hard for our pilots to know exactly what they were. Above all doing this, or maybe not above all, but also doing this, what this um, did was prevent the implementation of Air Force doctrine which called for um, damaging enemy forces and, um, uh, re and, and infrastructure by hitting, the, hitting vital targets in their heartland. You could not do this. Um, further, the rules of engagement violate, violated two key military principles. Security, never give your enemy an advantage, and obviously surprise. It was very easy to know what was going on. All of this was done um, with, um, with, um, against military advice, and it became, and if you read the memoirs, a very, very sore point uh, with senior military advisor, advise, um, officers. Um, General John, um, John McConnell, who was the Air Force Chief of Staff for, during part of this time, uh, wrote that um, um, the um, rolling thunder um, failed because of restrictions placed on the Air Force. I'm going to cite two analysts, um, two colonels who an analyze this later. One was a guy named Joseph Cerami, and he wrote that the slow squeeze succeeded only in preventing the attainment of strategic, American strategic objectives. And I want to um, read one more from, from uh, that I cite in my book. It said rather well. This man's name was um, Ellsworth, Colonel Ellsworth, and he said this. Um, President Johnson showed he did not understand the inherent nature of air power as an offensive weapon. Bombing halts and ceasefires hindered a continuous and concentrated strategic bombing campaign. They allowed the North Vietnamese to reconstitute their forces, reestablish their lines of supply, and generally outlast the American effort. Um, Again, um, perhaps worst of all, it allowed the building of um, the air defense network. And how this could be done, why we would allow such a thing, uh, might escape most of you. Uh, and it's really tough to explain. But um, apparently it had to do, at least in part, with the signals we were sending. Uh, back in 1965, when they started building these things, Westmoreland wanted to bomb them. And he had a meeting with um, one of the sec sec Assistant Secretary of Defense, McNaughton. And McNaughton said to him, um, no, you, you can't do it. They're not going to be used. Um, Soviets are just trying to pacify the North Vietnamese. And um, this was reflected in a memo that McNaughton wrote to, um, to McNamara, which I assume McNamara agreed with. And this is what he wrote. We won't bomb the sites. And that will be a signal to North Vietnam not to use them. <laughs> um, to um, orthodox historians who wrote the, um, uh, Leslie Gelb and Richard Betts, um, who wrote the book The Irony of Vietnam, they were orthodox historians, but as they wrote, kind of simply, McNaughton turned out to be wrong. Uh, uh, um, the ROEs did other things. Um, we weren't, this, our colleagues weren't allowed to a attack um, under all sorts of different circumstances. One incident where Navy pilots uh, came across more than 100 SAMs being transported uh, in, by railroad cars. They were not allowed to hit them. They couldn't fire on SAM bases until um, they were fired upon themselves. As one pilot put it, we had to fight them all, these 111 SAMs, I think it was, one at a time. 
making matters worse, and you can see it again from these maps I have behind me, um, the SAMs, um, many of the SAMs were located less than 10 miles from Hanoi. In that case, they were safe. They were in that donut there. But they had a range of 27 miles, which meant, um, obviously, our planes attacking targets there were exposed. And I want to read what um, General William Momyer has said. Uh, he was the um, head of the 7th Air Force from 1966 to 1968. And uh, I have a couple of quotes from him, but this is the first. Um, as he put it, the SAMs could hit us whenever we came after one of the significant targets near Hanoi, but our rules of engagement prevented us in most cases from hitting back. Um, couldn't attack the main MiG base 20 miles from Hanoi until 1967. All of this is from Amir. And not until 1966 was he allowed to attack the whole air defense system, the radars, the anti-aircraft guns, the SAMs, the MiGs, systematically. But even then, he couldn't attack the whole thing. As you put it, I was never allowed to attack the entire system. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that Johnson apparently feared that this might bring China into the war or even the Soviet Union. But a number of visionist historians who have written about this, and Mark is one of them, um, have pointed out that the uh, chances for this were very, very low and were knowable at the time. And other historians, and there are two Chinese historians uh, I've read on this, I'm not going to mispronounce their names for you, um, uh, have said essentially the same thing. So uh, we outsmarted ourselves, it seems. All of this, of course, meant that um, interdiction, you know, keeping the stuff from going down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, was very, very difficult. I'll go back to Momyer, and there he is with Johnson, and there's a the famous quote about the outhouses. Um, um, Momyer um, uh, wanted, as, as, as you put it, um, he wanted to um, bomb, uh, he wanted to close the port of Haiphong, to bomb the railroads, um, to really stop it all. Um, but um, the Navy was not allowed under Johnson to attack Haiphong. And the Air Force, while allowed to bomb at least some of the railroads, was not, a, was not allowed to bomb the largest bridges um, crossing the Red River, the crucial river, um, because of the fear of civilian casualties. And this is how Mamia sums it up, and I certainly can't do it any better. Effective, um, oh yeah, here it is. Waiting until the enemy has disseminated his supplies among thousands of trucks, sampans, rafts, bicycles, and then to send our multi-million dollar um, aircraft after these individual vehicles, this is how to maximize our cost, not his. And that's what um, it did. Um, just want to sum up Rolling Thunder now. Um, the fact that we hit, in the end, almost every target, there was originally a JCS list of 94 targets, in the end, and did massive destruction, really is in many ways irrelevant. And um, Walton points this out. Johnson did not allow the most lucrative targets to be hit, the key industrial infrastructure, um, the port of Haiphong, of course, um, key bridges, and for that matter, the seat of government. Um, the bombs, and here I'm following a, a book called Gradual Failure by J Jacob Van Staveron, which I think is the definitive book on 1965, Rolling Thunder. The bombs fell on less important targets. Our combat pilots took risks over and over again by striking relative the unimportant targets. Um, you've heard a little about um, um, Mr. Pike, who was um, our leading expert um, on, really on, on the Viet Cong. And uh, in 1983, he was at a conference, and I think some of the people in this room might have been there, where Pike was asked about this. And he said, you know, if we'd have done what we did with the Christmas bombing in 1965, there's a good chance we could have ended the war in 1965. Bu Chen, who has been mentioned, the Vietnamese colonel, the, you know, uh, the North Vietnamese colonel who accepted the surrender in, in Saigon in 65, and then eventually defected, um, he wrote, and he wrote this. Um, expanding in slow stages didn't worry us. We had plenty of time to prepare. It wasn't the problem. 
And uh, John Correll, who um, of the Air Force Association is a leading member of that, put it this way, I think it's the best epitaph that I can come up with. Um, Rolling Thunder was not built to succeed, and it didn't. <laughs>